make sure that everything works here. Okay, well, I'm always intimidated with such a uh, distinguished crowd here, but um, having taught a course for uh, several times uh, with Arun and, and, and Jim, they're always kind enough not to say anything. So uh, I will go ahead and proceed. Um, I first got started with uh, centrophaser measurement. Um, I was working in the laboratory at Bonneville Power, and I just finished one project and I needed another one. And so I met with uh, uh, a meeting with uh, Arun and some others in, at uh, WAC headquarters in Salt Lake City. And I remember sitting there and Arun was describing how he's going to do this, how he's going to measure all the phase angles and using these spectral phasers. And I'm going, how do you get phase angle off, off of a Fourier transform? But of course, I suppose we all learned that way back in college somewhere and soon forgot it because all we really look at is the voting plots and, and the, the uh, magnitude response. So anyway, uh, I had already been working with timing a little bit and really kind of questioned as to how anything could distribute time to uh, uh, less than one microsecond accuracy over uh, a distance. So I wasn't sure about GPS. I wasn't sure about the phase angle crossings. And, um, I wondered, we already had quite an extensive system using analog telemetry uh, into our EMS or into the SCADA system for doing kind of fairly high speed um, uh, measurements of voltage and current and power. But of course, we didn't do phasers at the time. So um, anyway, BPA, uh, along with AEP, the, the project that Mark was talking about, has contracted with um, with uh, Virginia Tech to, for the first PMUs, and I think that um, I think that some of the people at, at BPA were a little bit reluctant to go on with this, so they just basically handed it off to us in the laboratory and said, "Go test it and see if it works." So I had my challenge in front of me. Little did I realize I had most of my career in front of me, <laughs> but um, it, it's been a great career, so I have no regrets. So we received the first PMU from. Virginia Tech in about 1989, and um, the, this is basically the PMU. I think you've already seen the picture in a couple different incarnations. Uh, we ended up building a couple of these ourselves because they ran a couple of individual tests. Uh, but the, uh, this is basically what it looked like. It was a VME box with a bunch of cables. I will I have to mention I, I tried to find it, but we. The second PMU we received from them was in a box that was mostly round. It had fallen off the back of the truck, apparently, <laughs> and our shipping department didn't know enough to refuse it. So we took it out of the box. All the corners were smashed in, and most of the wires were detached. So with many phone calls later, we figured out where to reattach all the wires. As you can see, it's not exactly um, duck soup. Okay, the other issue was the GPS, and it turned out this was probably a bigger challenge than the PMU because uh, pretty much all the GPS receivers at that time were laboratory experiments, and they seemed to have, the manufacturers seemed to have no clue as to what we wanted to have, where we were doing 24-7. Uh, we tried to explain to them that we don't turn the power off at night. We'd leave it on all night long, and we would like our instruments and our relays and so forth to run all night long. And uh, this is just an example of what you see is uh, deviations during the times of periods of time that with the um, there was no satellites. Uh, we, it wasn't until about 1992 I think we got full visibility. Before that, we went through all kinds of things about getting rubidium oscillators or high high precision <coughs> crystal oscillators, and it was it was quite a deal. In fact, I think our first really um, our first, let's say, field-capable PMU, I mean, uh, GPS receiver at a rubidium oscillator and cost about $30,000. So we talked to you on that one, Mark. Yeah. Um, what we did is then um, we put them on, on our Northwest Southwest Intertime. So we put one at John Day uh, up here on the Columbia River and one of them at Malin so we could kind of capture dynamics. And I put together a system which, um, we had our analog telemetry coming from each station and our 
and then we also put in these modems, 4,800 baud modems, as Mark mentioned, so that we could get the phaser data. At the time, we could only transfer at 12 per second because um, that was as fast as the modem would go. So we built a uh, master in the labs, which uh, recorded both of them side by side. We took several months' worth of readings and compared them. One of the interesting things to me was that, first off, they did track on a diurnal basis. This is a weak plot quite well. But when we subtracted them, we found this kind of an interesting wander. We finally figured out that that's because the analog has a tendency <coughs> over time to wander, and it, it's not very predictable. <coughs> We found that the phaser measurements were dead accurate and solid over long periods of time. So that was definitely a step in the right direction. We also found when we compared them that the phaser measurements were nice and clean and the analog had a lot of noise in it. As uh, one of my colleagues said, it looked like a woolly worm. And interestingly enough, you know, this is what we were using before. It has like uh, 5 kV of, of um, noise on it, which we just ignored. And later, when people are looking at phaser measurements, you know, they're complaining because they can't, because we have an offset between two buses of 400 volts. I try to explain them, well, you couldn't even see that before, so why are you worried about it now? But um, that's the problem, is that every time you increase their ability to see things, then, then they want something more. We also did some, uh, I think the first real laboratory tests where we tried looking at step changes with the phaser measurements and different frequencies of modulations and found that it, it tracked amazingly well. So I was pretty convinced that this is a great thing. Um, not all my colleagues were, but we kept working on it on the back burner. And um, finally, in, we had the blackout in 1996. And uh, suddenly, luckily, we had captured some inner area uh, differences, particularly the phase angle. And nobody else could see that. So we got permission to build a whole new, or I should say funding and permission, to build a whole new system. So we put together the first officially named PDC in 1997 and built out from there. I also want to step back and mention that uh, the first synchrophaser standard, uh, uh, Arun in initiated that in 1992. And I decided, uh, I talked to um, Jay Murphy and he said, well, you know, you ought to go to the PRCRC meetings, you know, they, they create standards. And he says, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a place where a bunch of, uh, bunch of old relay engineers get together and have a few beers and, and write standards and sit in meetings and have a good time. Well, it wasn't quite that way, but anyway, so um, Arun invited me to be the, the vice chair of that working group. Before it was over, he got called to be an officer, so I got to be the chair, and I didn't realize that was going to be a um, career also. That was all his plan. <laughs> because I'm still the chair. <laughs> I tried to give it away. I actually did, twice. Um, so anyway, going back to the development, at BPA and WEC, we started the first real-time wide area data exchange with Southern California Edison in 98. We expanded that to California ISO and Western Area Power in 2003. In 2005, we completed the, the real, what I would call the real basis for synchrophaser standards in in 37.118, and then we finished revising that in 2011. And sad to say, we're still revising. So hopefully we'll be done again um, in another year with that. Although then the IEC is going to start working on it. So who knows where that'll go. Um, so synchrophasers now, as you've heard from many people, are well established, widely distributed. There's hundreds. Uh, how will they help us? Well, we've had a lot of background on that. So Matt challenged me to throw out something that was going to be way out there. Well, it turns out I thought it was kind of way out there, and I didn't know if I wanted to do this, but now I find it's not way out there at all. It's, what are we going to do next? Well, the future of electric power. Is it going to be DC? <coughs> well, I was at a, at a uh, conference a couple of years ago, and I was just quite impressed with how much of this stuff is going to DC. 
And in particular, if you buy a cell phone or almost any kind of an accessory and you plug it into the wall, what do they do? They convert it to DC before they have a transformer, then they put it into your devices. If you look at, um, for example, some of these wind farms, they're talking about straight DC transmission across that. We have DC transmission in shorter and shorter distances. The whole thing that really kind of impressed me is that there seems to be no end to exactly how far we can push electronics. And if you can take um, a bunch of silicon and deposit it on something and get a really good process, it's not very expensive to make. And they're saying that even for uh, high voltage is that uh, you can you can put together a DC converter cheaper than you can make a big transformer. Now, it's certainly true with the little stuff, but I don't know where the big stuff is going. But I see it more and more, and in particular, we're going to be having to deal with DC. We've got wind farms, we've got photovoltaic farms, uh, wave, small core generation, as well as talking about converting on and off uh, electrical batteries uh, for storage or electric uh, devices that are going to use some kind of DC storage. So whether DC is, is really going to be the look in the future or not, uh, it's with us and certainly a lot of the effects of DC and AC interaction is with us. So the question of whether we're going to find uh, a DC transmission in the future or uh, for me more in particular, you know, how are we going to use um, DC with synchrophasers, you know, this could be a little problem. Um, but the bottom line here is that DC is with us, interactions between AC and DC are with us, therefore we need systems that will deal with both um, the, the things that these new kinds of equipment are going to create. One of them happens to be really high, fre high frequency oscillations and fast variation. So, Here's a couple of uh, actual recordings here made from a D an unstable DC converter <coughs> oscillating at about 5 hertz. And here's a malfunctioning wind farm controller that is uh, up, so up somewhere around 5 hertz. We've seen more and more reports of this and traditional SCADA has no way, to, no way to deal with it, no way to detect it. So these are some of the areas in which um, synchrophasers have come along at the right time. So we have bigger and bigger penetration of renewables. Uh, we have economic dispatch. We have distributed and small generation as well as more energy storage. We've got load controls, um, which all leads to more variability in transmission loading, more uh, controllers interfacing transmission. So what, what it means is that we need better measurements. We need wider measurement bandwidth. We need higher accuracy systems. We need to uh, measure all the parameters, including uh, face angle. And we need to have faster reporting to uh, you know, less latency in the, in the measurements. All of that points to things that we can do with it, such as tighter operating limits, uh, improved models, wide area view for situational awareness, oscillation detection, and proof state estimation. All things that other people have talked about here. So, synchrophasers can serve the need. I really believe that we have a technology whose time has come. I think that uh, the fact that we've managed to deploy a whole bunch of these things, um, it's, it's, they're all waiting for something to do. And uh, I think we're finding a lot of things. We certainly have the needs. All we have to do is find a way put them into use. So with that, I think I may, I'm down to my one minute warning, or 30 second warning. And uh, I guess, you know, as kind of a final statement, I just really want to thank uh, particularly Aaron Arun and also Jim, um, who have been my mentors, and I've been proud to be included in, in uh, many consultations and work that we've done from China to India to Russia to uh, every, every place uh, around the globe that I've been so far. So thank you very much for everybody.